Hello all, this is the Owl, and today, as per popular request, let's take a look at, well, this nightmare. While there are those who venerate Junji Ito or Kazuo Umezu, I'd be confident to say that Masaki Nakayama may be the true current master of Japanese horror, and it's wonderful to see his works gradually starting to get the attention they deserve. Now, I covered Fua no Tane a bit back. You can check it out here or the link in the description. Boy, has my audio come a ways in a month. Fua no Tane is a bit different from your standard horror anthology in that it doesn't so much consist of a bunch of short stories, it instead focuses on vignettes. Basically, just the scares. Brief one, two, or three page sequences of horror without any sort of real overarching narrative or framing device. And at the time of reading, it was likely the single scariest piece of Japanese media that I'd ever encountered, with only its sequel series PTSD Radio and maybe one or two bits from stuff like Higurashi, as covered here, beating it out. Fua no Tane was moderately well received in Japan, spawning an okay movie and a pseudo-sequel series, Fua no Tane Plus, which, if anything, is even scarier than the original. As per last time, I'm not going to cover every single vignette. Instead, I'm going to focus on a handful that I consider to be the most frightening, or at least the most interesting. But there's a reason that I use pseudo-sequel, in that Fua no Tane Plus is more like Fua no Tane 1.5. There's a lot of new content, especially at the start of the manga, but there's also a fair amount of content reused from the original. Although, to be fair, it's generally the better stuff. Yeah, this is a complicated series. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's dive on in. And a word of warning. If you're of a nervous disposition, this may not be one to watch in the dark. And by that I mean, this is absolutely one to watch in the dark. Alone, if possible. <laughs> first up, Ochonan. As I mentioned back in the first Four Notane, towards the end we get our first look at a horribly distorted creature it'll be the closest thing to a framing device, or at least a linking device, in Fonotane Plus, that actually continues somewhat into PTSD radio. Our story opens with a kid's diary, describing the creature and saying that it hides when adults are around. But when the kid, whose name we later learn is Ryuta, is alone, it moves around the house. We then see the parents reading the diary, and it turns out they've also seen the creature. And we see that it appears in an old photo of the family during the house's construction. Woof. There's just something about this idea of looking over old photos and seeing something that shouldn't be there that spooks me. The vignette ends with another diary entry, saying that the family moved but the kid misses Ochonan. Yeah, you're a weird kid. We'll learn a bit more about this later. Next up, we get a few weird stories. A man out riding his bike in the early morning hours. Here's something that he thinks is a kitten calling for help, but it's actually this abomination making the noise. Verdict, which involves a middle-aged man warning some kids not to play hide-and-seek in the main temple building before one of the kids looks back at him and... and a few others that are more odd than scary. Our next really good one is called Night of the Blackout, one of the most iconic Fuanotane stories actually one that made it into the film. You'll see why. We open in pitch blackness, where a Tokyo family is suddenly caught in a, well, blackout. The Great Tokyo Blackout, actually. A real event, 
caused by a primary power line being severed, which plunged the entire city into darkness for several hours. Although, coming from South Africa, this sounds like your average Tuesday. Initially, they suspect that a breaker has been triggered, but as they look out of their apartment, the entire city is dark. Suddenly, with a porchi, the family is lit up as the eldest daughter, Yukari, flicks on the emergency flashlight to illuminate the room. Yukari is messing around, flicking the light on and off, creating a strobe effect, which annoys her family. This trick of having the lights turn off and on and on and off is actually a horror mechanism that I'm very fond of. You see it used a fair amount in a lot of found footage movies. Yukari continues to play silly buggers, despite her family telling her to knock it off, until... What the blithering ass chickens is that? And the vignette ends with Yukari screaming. Next, the man who couldn't go downstairs. Wow, does this one strike home for me. Our story opens with a nameless character needing to go downstairs to bleed the lizard, but he can't. Why? Well, when the lights are on, the downstairs is harmless, but when he turns the lights off, there's something there, something waiting for him. Yeah, see, when I was a kid, I slept in a small upstairs room in our farmhouse, and both the phone and the Kazi were located downstairs from me. However, my father, a professional hunter, had a gigantic taxidermied kudu head mounted on the wall above the phone, and if I needed the bog, I'd have to go past it in pitch darkness. During the day, the head was merely ominous, but at night, I knew that one day, I'd walk past it and it would lunge down from the wall at me or follow me back to bed. This was a problem when I needed the loo. I figured out that with a bit of aim, I could use the upstairs window overlooking the flower beds. But see, my parents' bedroom was a ways away across the house and thus, if the phone rang at night, I was expected to answer it at all of six years old. Of course, one night there was a huge storm, and sure enough, the phone started ringing. I really didn't want to go downstairs, but I knew that if I didn't, I would get shouted at the next day. I slowly made my way downstairs, in the dark, tentatively poked my head around the corner, and then crept over to the phone once I saw that all was clear. As I reached for the handset, it stopped ringing. Then I looked up, and the head was gone. I turned around, and sure enough, the head was on the floor, right next to me, close enough to touch. Yet, yeah, to this day, I can't see this image without feeling the hairs on my neck rise. It's just too damn similar to that old house we lived in. Anyway, the next few stories are sort of meh. Some sort of soul eater visits a guy at night. The su indicates inhaling or sucking. And another weird one, where a girl sees some odd smoke shaped like a man curling out of a chimney, and then sees that her finger is horribly broken. Where? Our next interesting one is a continuation of Ochonan. Ryuta, the kid from the last story, is chatting with his granddad. Apparently, he and his brother also saw a creature with a similar face in their youth, but they believed it to be a guardian spirit, despite its horrible face. However, he warns Ryuta that while this creature is harmless, there's a much nastier variety, giving a brief, abstract image of the thing, yet yeah, Keep this image in mind when we tackle PTSD radio, by the way. Ryuta looks up and sees something looking in the window. We get a few more okay stories. Note that while I'm skipping a lot of these, 
They are in general of a much higher quality than the first four no Tane, including one that is probably a reference to Dark Water, a somewhat well-known Japanese horror movie from the early 2000s, and kind of a melancholy one involving a ghost girl and the railway. It takes a goodly amount of time before we get back to the really good stuff. A teacher is working late one night at a local school. Believe it or not, this isn't uncommon in Japan when he hears a weird chittering in the next room. Suspecting rats, he grabs the bug spray, yeah, that's going to stop a rat, and heads off into the gloom to investigate. He locates the sound coming from an air vent above him. He shines his torch up, looks in, and... The thing then starts screaming, falls out onto the floor in front of him, and its face erupts before it curls up like a dying spider. Huh, so that's where rats come from. Next up, wardrobe. Another common childhood phobia that fortunately never plagued me. A child lies awake at night, watching something on top of his wardrobe coming closer and closer until... <laughs> Later, the family sold the wardrobe and as they drive past the second hand store, the kid sees a familiar figure on top of it as the story ends on an oddly sad note. Well, maybe if you didn't act like such a creeper, random wardrobe ghost kid. Next up, Black Man. The story opens with a man returning from vacation. He opens his apartment door to be greeted by the stink of rotting meat. He calls the cops who find nothing in his apartment or the nearby area, and while he persists, they leave annoyed. But of course, every now and then, the man will catch a whiff of something foul late at night. Then, one night, as he lies in bed, the smell comes back again, worse than ever before. He sits bolt upright, turns, and sees a pitch black figure staring at him from the corner of the room. This alone is, yeah, feces inducing, but it gets worse. Holding his hand over his nose, he looks at the figure and sees a weird smile on its face. But it's not a smile. As the figure shambles in closer, standing over the man, we see that it's in fact a rictus. The black man is a rotting corpse swarming with bugs. We get some more decent stories, with probably the most interesting bit being meeting weird psychic kid Noburo, who we will see in a few more Fuanotane stories, and if I'm not mistaken makes another appearance in PTSD radio. The next good one comes quite a bit further in. Soft toy. A young woman sees a stuffed animal that looks like one she owned when she was a child. But after she took it home, she stopped sleeping properly and even weirder, when she woke up, the doll would have moved. Oh, that's not good. One night, she wakes up and hears a child's voice telling her not to take the doll. She opens her eyes to see, lovely, just look at the eyes on that thing. By this point, we're nearing the end of the manga. There's a few more good ones in there, but there are two that I really like. The first, Creeper, opens with two young boys playing karuta at home, and they hear someone on the roof. For some reason, they think that it's the sister of one of the boys, and neither seems especially concerned. And of course, we see Ooh, that's creepy. The last one is one of my all-time favorites. Stare. It's a very simple story, 
but it deals with one of the scariest scenarios that I can imagine. A lady walking home from work at night begins to see an odd figure staring at her from hiding. She has no idea what it is, but it's definitely ominous, and it starts popping up wherever she goes. If she stops and looks around closely, chances are that she'll spot it hidden in the scenery somewhere. One night, she opens her curtain to see... At work the next evening, she tells her friends about the weird figure, and they tell her in turn to contact the police. But that night, she walks home and assumably doesn't see it. However, when she gets home, she's about to head indoors when she looks up and sees... Yikes. Well, it's waiting for her inside her house now, clinging to the ceiling somehow. Yeah, the old joke about the gorilla comes to mind. And this is another very clever scare, as it preys on a deep evolutionary fear. The feeling of a space that used to be safe, now being invaded by something loathsome. I'm sure anyone who's discovered a huge spider or a centipede in their house, but then lost track of it, or worse, comes home to find the door open, or things moved around can identify with this. The manga ends with a few stories that are more odd than scary, featuring Ochonans and that weird abstract face from before, which yes, is setting the scene somewhat for PTSD radio. We'll get more into that when we do radio, maybe in the summer. Anyway, that's me for the day, and... Sorry. I couldn't resist. I hope that you enjoyed that. If you did, why not stick around? There's plenty more like this and lots more to come. If you want to help us out, you could always head over to our Patreon. Otherwise, take care my friends, and I'll see you next time. You won't be seeing me for a bit. I'll be hard at work on Made in Abyss Part 4. With that, this is the Owl, signing off.